All right, so if you want to do this, you can open up your web browser. Let's go to developer.android.com. So we, we looked at developer.marvel.com briefly last time when we talked about JSON. And I said that many websites, many projects have a developer's portal that is very useful to read documentation and such. So Android, Android operating system, which powers the vast majority of mobile devices, they have a developer's portal. They have here where you can learn how to make apps and keep up to date with the Android operating system. Android 8.0, codenamed Oreo, came out recently. And Android has a version number 8, 7, 6, etc., which also has a code name that is alphabetical, that is based on treats. So Android 7 was Android N before Oreo. Anyone know what Android N's code name was? Nougat. Okay, so before that, Android 6, uh, L, M, M. Okay, M. What was Android M, anyone? Marshmallow. Marshmallow. Before that, Android Lollipop. Lollipop. So they all have these fun, tasty uh, code names. Uh, you can either refer to it by the code name Oreo or the big version number, version 8, version 4, version 4.4, whatever. We also have what we'll see later as known as an API which is a sequential number starting from 1, and right now I think it's like on 27 or something. So it's the subversions all added up. But the reason to know this is because we are going to create apps, and we want to target devices. We, it might not behoove us to target... I'm going to target Android 1 to Android 8, every single possibility. Uh, we might see why that's not a great idea, perhaps. So we need to know what versions of Android are out, which versions of Android are most popular, because even though version 8 is out, some of the stats that I saw recently is that a lot of people are like two or two and a half versions behind through you know the global stats that we can look at. Uh, oftentimes people have like Android 5.0 or 5.2, even though 8 is out. And that's really the fault, and there's no excuse, that's the fault of the carrier. AT&T, Verizon, and all of them, they are the ones to blame. Because with Android, the good and the bad about it is that it's open source. Google has the code, and they release the code, and then it's up to the Verizon and such to allow your phone to get the latest version. So we're going to see the problem of fragmentation, where I might want to create an app that taps into the latest and the greatest in version 8. But statistics show that like 1% of 1% of people have Android 8. So I might not want to target the latest versions of the operating system. And I would learn about this at the developer portal. So later on, we'll go much deeper into the site, but this is where you get the, those usage statistics. This is where you can go over to get more training and learn about, for example, material design, which is the term that they use for the style of what an Android app looks like. So remember a few years ago that all of our devices, Android or iPhone, all of our devices had like a lot of drop shadows and shininess and three-dimensionality and such, and that was cool and that was the future. Now that's passe. Now most of our devices have a more flat style, icons that look something like that. Simple colors, very subdued drop shadows. You see that on iOS, on Windows, on Android. So the developer's portal is not just the place where we would go to learn about what's the right code to do the right thing. But we would also learn about what's the style of Android. How do I design the look of my project so that it looks like a real Android device, as a, or Android app, as opposed to an iPhone app? And now there's this new generation of wearables. What does that mean? What are wearables? Well, like the wristwatch and such, things that you wear. And most likely also like the headsets and stuff that, that they're working on. 
So there's this whole new generation. How do you make an app that works on a, on a smartwatch that's like two inches big? I don't have a real screen to work with. I've only got a little watch face. How do I do that? So the developer portal at, at android.com is what you want to, uh, you know, before you go to bed, read, read inside of here a little bit every time as a good bedtime story uh, to kind of get acclimated to this whole concept of mobile development. This is just one of the portals. Let's look at another one here, developer.apple.com. This is Apple's version. Same sort of idea. Where do I go to learn the official information about making apps for iOS, which includes iPhones, iPads, then there's Watch OS. For the, for the uh, Apple Watch, there's Mac OS for the laptops and desktops. So this is just Apple's version of it. Here's where I would go and learn about design. How do I make an app that looks good on the different sizes of devices and the style? So they've got like a lot of gradients, transparency and such. How, does a, how do I make an app that looks good that looks native to that particular device. We would learn about it here. Examples of the code, do's and don'ts, because we will see that with, with Apple, they have a tendency a lot more to be more of a gatekeeper, allowing apps to be published. In contrast with Android, they're more reactionary in that just about anyone can publish just about any app for Android and it will go. It will go through and people can download. The bad about that, of course, is that it could be full of spam and spyware and all of that. Apple takes the opposite approach where usually it, it checks your app, it can reject your app, and they've been notorious for people spending thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars to develop an app and they get rejected with very little feedback. They are getting better at it, but um, the good and the bad of Apple's approach is that the quality of the apps, in theory, are often better, quote unquote better, than an Android app. Because Android's so open, as opposed to Apple being so closed, um, you get those kinds of extremes in app quality. Uh, lastly, we can also look at developer.windows.com. Now, Android and Android and iOS, they basically carved up the whole pie for mobile device. Everyone else is, a, is fighting for 1%. Remember BlackBerry. Microsoft had their version, has their version of mobile, Windows Mobile. Um, there's been other players. Uh, Firefox OS. Did you know that the Firefox team created a, an operating system to compete with iOS and Android. Uh, no one raised their hand, so no, you don't know about it because it didn't really work out. There, it, you can't stop the juggernauts of Android and, and Apple. However, Microsoft is trying to unify their operating system that the operating system is going to be the same, in theory, uh, that controls your computer, and your phone and your tablet. It's all integrated and you're supposed to be able to create one app and it'll run on all devices. So we'll see if it works out or not, but at least from what we're learning in this part of the class, part two, we will be able to create an app that would deploy to all devices just to cover all the bases. And here I would also read about the documentation, um, example code, submitting my app to their app store for people to download for free or to pay. I would have that over also at Apple. I would log into my account and publish my app and then see myself get rich 99 cents at a time. I would do the same thing over on app uh, on Android. I would go to the Play Console where I would manage my, my app and see how many downloads and how many crashes and all of that. And I'm an app developer. And so 
when we get to the publication part of it, I'll touch on it much more. But basically, to be to make an app, anyone can make an app for any of these platforms, basically. But to release it, to release your app on the official Android App Store, Google Play, uh, I believe it costs $28, unless they change it, $28 one-time fee to create your account, to, to publish. Then you have access to whatever billion devices that they claim are currently active. Um, and uh, $28 one-time fee, that's the cost of a nice pizza, to be an app developer and to publish apps for free or for pay. Even if you're going to give your apps away, you have to pay to get into the developer's portal. Uh, Windows also has a pretty low entry fee, something around there, $28, $27, $25, around there, for you to publish apps that go over to Windows Mobile, Windows Desktop, Windows Laptops. Um, have you heard about HoloLens, which is Microsoft's uh, augmented reality headset? Uh, so you put on this headset, and you're going to see holograms all over the place, and you're going to interact with it and such. So $28 to become a Windows developer and publish your apps to reach that audience. One-time fee. In contrast, Apple is a little more expensive. It's a $99 fee, and it's also yearly. So if you want to target to sell on Android or on uh, iPhone, it's $99. If you want to give away your apps, it's also $99. So there's a big barrier to entry, but studies show, statistics show, that developers, app developers, often profit more on the iOS platform uh, than the other platforms. The sort of culture of an Android user is often someone that's interested in different things and trying things, but doesn't often, is, isn't often prone to paying uh, for the apps, even 99 cents. Yes? Do you happen to know what percentage of the revenue they take from you, Apple takes from you? Yes, all three of the developers take about 30% of your revenue. So at a 99 cent app, I get about 70-ish cents out of that. So they also take 30% out of my free apps, 30% you know, of zero. <laughs> so um, it is that barrier to entry, but Comparatively, we can release the same app on Android and, and iOS, and oftentimes uh, iOS is the one where you profit a little bit more because the culture around Apple is, yeah, 99 cents for this song, 99 cents for that game, 99 cents in-app purchase. The culture of it seems to be that, it, that they're a little bit more prone uh, to spend on, on these apps. Now, not, that's not to say you're not going to get rich off of Android, of course, because it is a much larger... Uh, amount of devices, but just keep that in mind, and keep that in mind that it is a little expensive just to get your foot in the door. And just an FYI, Android owns eighty-five percent of the market share worldwide. Exactly. So perhaps iPhone has a bigger mind share, but Android definitely is the bigger market share. More devices in the world use uh, an Android, a version of Android operating system, than iOS. So that's why in this class, we'll be looking at how do we target them both, target them all. You know, I want to put my app wherever I can to find my audience. On the desktop side, you know, regular computers inside, Windows has, the, has, a, has a large market share, uh, but still it has a smaller market share uh, if you add up you know, uh, Android devices. So it's a big piece of the pie for Android. So we'll cover that in more detail when we get to it, when we're ready to release our apps. We're still far away from that. Our app's nowhere near complete. Our development environment is not set up. So traditionally, to create uh, an Android app, we would use Android Studio, which is uh, downloadable right over there, and uh, requires you to use Java. Java, which is completely different than JavaScript. We both share that root name, but Java and JavaScript code is different. So traditionally we would you know, get a 500 page book of Java and learn Java and then uh, start to make an Android app. Then we'd have to reprogram our app 
First in Objective C, that was the language a long time on iOS, and now they're pushing Swift. So you'd have to reprogram your app that you made in Android and reprogram it to a different language to target iOS. And then if you wanted to go over to Windows, you'd have to reprogram it again. And that time, uh, this time would be Objective C. So huge programming languages with their own syntax and their own pros and cons, and you'd have to know three big languages to target each device. So this whole class is going to focus on uh, a, a way for our code to be translated into the proper language for us. Let's look at this other website, cordova.apache.org. Cordova.apache.org. Cordova is a project that's been out for several years. Uh, it's an open source project with a lot of people behind it trying to fix that, that issue, trying to deal with, I don't want to learn all of the languages to target the devices. The Cordova project attempts to basically, behind the scenes, convert your project to the right language, to the right platform. How many of you had heard of Cordova before part one or part two of this class? Okay, a couple of people, cool. How many of you had heard of its variation PhoneGap before this class? Okay, so PhoneGap, aka Cordova, we'll talk about the nuances later. But this project, this software, is what, what we'll be focusing on, which is and using the technologies, the languages that many of us have experience in, of web technologies, we will be able to target the different operating systems with one code base. Uh, Android, iOS, uh, Windows, Blackberry, I guess if you want to be ironic, uh, but we'll be able to target the different devices. There are pros and cons, of course, to this approach, as we will see uh, a little bit later, but we have a way to reach that those market shares. So this website is the uh, is the Cordova portal where it shows you example apps, uh, code snippets, other platforms and frameworks to make it work easier, devices that you can target, and then of course quick get started and deeper documentation. So we'll be referring to this website because how do I write that code again to take a photo? Oh, I go look it up into the documentation, and that's just going to be a couple of lines of JavaScript. Then Cordova will basically compile or translate or convert the JavaScript code in the pro into the proper Java code version, uh, Objective-C version, or uh, C-sharp version. Because it is a middleman, there is some performance issues, but that often is most important when we're dealing with graphics-intensive or multimedia-intensive apps. What might be an example of a multimedia-intensive app that you can think of? Minecraft. Minecraft. A game, yes. So games. Games are often the ones that a Cordova version might not be the best route. It might be better to write your app really in Swift or Java or C Sharp, you know, closer to the metal. This is a middleman that will take one code, translate it into the other code, and there can be a performance issue, usually when it's multimedia heavy projects. Our project that we're creating here is not heavy at all. Uh, the most complex stuff is the JavaScript logic of it, but the animations and the transitions and the usage of it should not have any problems when we when we use Cordova. And as I've said, I've taught this uh, class, and every class, every semester, it gets better. The language, uh, the translators, Cordova gets better, more efficient, and all of that. And there are many apps, many examples that you can see of real apps for for all the platforms. So we're going to create our CBDB app that eventually, ultimately, we will release to a real app store. 
That'll definitely be done in part three of the class, and that would be the final homework at the very end of the course. As I said also, however, once we learn more about how do we access features of a device, I have an idea for an app. I have an idea. It's going to be, you know, um, a uh, tennis match tracking app where all of the players are uh, going to have their own profile and it's going to take photos of the match and video and all of that. Let's say you have your own idea for an app. I've had students in previous semesters create, for example, there was a someone that did a fitness app. They worked at a at an elementary school and for their fitness department they wanted the kids to be able to track how many jumping jacks they did this time and you know how many of hours of hours of sleep they got. So you will be able to make you with your idea you most you probably will be able to make your version of your idea once we get all of the pieces of the of the puzzle. And Cordova gives us these pieces. How do I access, you know, the accelerometer? Let's say we want to track how many jumping jacks by actually jumping. We'll be able to track the accelerometer of the device that checks a jump. So once you get the pieces of the project, you can make your own version of an app to release, but so that we're all on the same page, we're all going to create our version of the CBDB app. You're going to customize it, of course, with your own graphics and text and functionality and such, but together we're going to be working toward a common CBD app. And on the side, you could be working on your app. So, the getting started part here talks something about a command line. What's a command line? Terminal. It is basically this. Remember this? Anyone ever use the command prompt back in the day or recently? How many of you have used the Windows or the Mac terminal or command prompt within the last year? Oh, good, good, good amount of people. Uh, how many have never looked at this scary thing before? <laughs> a couple of people. Okay, that's fine. So back in the old days, this is what a computer was. There was no mouse and there were no icons to click. You had to type commands. You had to type, you know, cd dot dot slash and then DRR, blah blah blah. You have to do all this stuff. You have to type commands. And if you type the command wrong, instead of DIR, I type DAR, it would give me a, an error, a totally unuseful error. So this command prompt, a classic operating system of computers, is still around nowadays. It's kind of getting a resurgence when you're dealing with like really advanced web projects and mobile projects because this can oftentimes be more efficient than software with graphics and icons and all of that. For example, uh, here it says, okay, you want to install Cordova, so in your command prompt you type npm install dash g Cordova. And again, I'm never going to be able to remember that. Yes, you will, but the documentation here, of course, tells you. Then we're going to create an app. Well, instead of clicking a button, it would be Cordova create my app. If you type the right commands, and there's only like a dozen of them or less, if you type the right command, this is often more efficient than an interface. Well, still, even though I've taught this class several times and have created lots of graduates with real apps, this is still daunting and difficult for a lot of people. So luckily, Visual Studio to the rescue. Luckily, all of these other software packages that are trying to kind of shield us from the command prompt. We can still do it from the command prompt, but all of this other software, even Adobe's gotten in the game. They've got their own version, Adobe PhoneGap, where you have a nice pretty interface where you click buttons and drag things instead of typing arcane commands. So I used to teach this class for several semesters where it was command prompt. Remember, Cheryl? So now I teach it, and it seems to be more effective because Microsoft has also, amazingly, i got to give them props, they've put out a version of Visual Studio that really lets you do this with a real sort of app interface that is very much more intuitive. The downside is, is that it is 
a hefty installation of between 4 gigabytes and like 20 gigabytes for like every single extension and such. So if you're trying to do this at home, you know, you need this, the space for it, and we'll see exactly the amount of space and such. And ideally also uh, a computer with a good amount of RAM and CPU and such. But we'll talk about that a little later. This is another reason why the command prompt can often work a little better, because there isn't that overhead of, of memory usage like big software. You're welcome to, of course, learn how to do it via the command prompt, but we're going to use Visual Studio. And as I said, in this class, it's already all installed, ready to go. But at home, after the handouts that I'll give you, uh, you're going to follow the handouts and uh, see the best settings to install it at home if you would like. You can, of course, only work in the lab. We have the lab time at the end of the day and the breaks and such, and people that have the, the hardship of not being able to do this at home have been able to complete the class by using our labs, our lab time. They put in the time, they stay, they put in the time, they create the app. So if you can't quite do it at home, it'll be time and a place to do it here. I do have to say again, um, you know, there's a kind of like strike one, for Apple, it's $99 a year. Strike two, the software is different enough on the Mac, unfortunately, that I have to have extra handouts to explain it a little bit more. It is a lot more straightforward, uh, you know, unfortunately, because obviously Visual Studio is from Microsoft, and Microsoft doesn't want to help very much Apple, their competitors. So the Visual Studio version of Apple isn't quite the same as the Visual Studio on Windows. But I have handouts to kind of smooth things out. So we will see all of those details as we go on. General questions? So we're going to refer to the Cordova site often. We're going to refer to the Android and Apple sites often. and. We're going to look at documentation as time goes on. I'm going to close... well, one more thing. Uh, let's go to visualstudio.com. Visualstudio.com. So this is all set up here. You don't need to download anything. I'm just telling you at home and I'll give you a handout in a moment. You have the Visual Studio IDE, the Integrated Development Environment. So that means it has a code editor, a debugger, testers, emulators, all of that. It's one environment. It's all integrated development environment. Uh, there's team services so that you can have backups of your code in the cloud. So I haven't actually had anyone do it in these classes, but what you could do is set yourself up with team services so that instead of taking your, your code home with you on a flash drive, it's in the cloud. You just log in and you pull it down and you work with it and you have version control and all of that. And then we have a very lightweight, simple kind of code editor like Notepad++. We have Visual Code also installed on these systems, I think. And it's just a, it's more about a code editor for web projects. So the Visual Studio is the big one for full app development. And there's the Community Professional and Enterprise Editions. We're going to use the Community Edition. That's what we've got installed, basically, when you're larger companies. And for the purposes, you have to decide which version you want. Short answer, Community Edition should work for most of us. There'll be plenty of documentation and videos to look at. And the big idea is that Cordova is so popular and ubiquitous and everyone loves it so much that so many projects have been built on top of it. Behind the scenes, what Visual Studio is going to do is access Cordova. Other things like PhoneGap and Monaca and such, they still, behind the scenes, access Cordova. We will see that we're going to write our code and test it and then deploy it to a real device. We're going to see all of this output, how it's actually compiling it and everything. And behind the scenes, it's using Cordova to create our apps that will work on all devices.
So if you were to install this at home, uh, it would ask you to, to, to log in with a free Microsoft account. Uh, so Hotmail or Outlook and such. Um, the, the software is free, but sometimes people, people see when it asks them to sign in, they skip. And then 30 days later, it says, you know, the software is expired. And people think, I have to pay for it now? No, you still just have to sign in to the account, uh, an, an Outlook account, um, which, is, which is free. Now, how many of you have an Outlook or a Hotmail account? A few people. Most of us have Gmail, right? So that is something we'll, we'll need to do uh, later on to create a hot, an, an Outlook account which actually can be tied to your Gmail, so you can log in with that. But we will see that we do need uh, some sort of Microsoft account to use the software. Besides that, it's free, um, so that shouldn't be a problem. And like I said, the other thing about it is that it's, it's kind of big software. If you're going to use Visual Studio slash Cordova to deploy to a real device, it's going to be a smaller installation, about four gigabytes. If you're going to, if you don't have a real device to work with and you want to use emulators, uh, which are going to be virtual phones that exist in your device, then and that's going to be more toward the 20 gigabytes because you have to run like a mini phone, a mini operating system in your computer. It just takes more resources. Let's check it out ourselves. You can close the browser if you want. In the Start menu, it might already be visible there, or you can search. Let's open Visual Studio 2017. So for the moment, we'll, we'll kind of do play a little bit with this, and then I'll give you some handouts after the break that sort of put it all together. In my case, I get a pop-up about signing in. Uh, you may not be able to do the not now. You can try it, but I think it'll still direct you back because the software was installed on these computers more than 30 days ago, so it's expecting a sign-in. Um, our first thing then to do here is either sign in with an account that exists or take a moment to sign up. So I do have an account, I'll just click sign in, but if you don't have one you'll have to follow a few steps to create a free account. Take a moment to do that, either sign in or click sign up to create an account. So we will be using Visual Studio throughout this whole month and next month. So it does behoove you to have this account set up. Take a moment to, to do so if you don't have that account. We'll get started in a moment. If you have any trouble, let me know. Like the other is, I mean, this looks a little bit more interesting. My iPad 
does ask you to sign up for an account or to sign in, you can do so. It might have popped up also to ask for a, um, I think it was a theme, if you wanted uh, a, a light theme or a dark theme or other things, just choose the default. But hopefully eventually you get to some sort of screen that looks like get started. So just wait there. Uh, couple of seconds to make sure everyone sees something like this. It's getting started screen. So there's a lot that we look at in this start page. There's a, a bunch of tutorials and other videos and such that I really recommend you, you do look at to get as much knowledge as possible. So there's a, are you new to Visual Studio? Check that out. Get training on languages, etc. We will see recent projects here. They'll be here open or create a project and then news. So if you did manage to start up the software, either under the open column, you can click, uh, oh, we don't have a project yet. Uh, go up to the file menu and then new project. So one thing about doing it via the command prompt is that you can, again, quickly get this done. In the command prompt, you simply type Cordova create project, and it does it. It's not so bad here going up to File, New, Project, yeah, but there's a lot of extra screens and things to do oftentimes that you can accomplish a lot faster in the command prompt. But anyway, File, New, Project. This project is completely temporary. You don't have to save it, but eventually we will be saving this to your flash drive. I'm saving this to the desktop. This project is just a quick test. It doesn't matter what it is, but I'll, I'll just save it wherever. And then down here, name, location, solution name. So whatever the name of my project, I can just call it test1. Eventually, this will be CBDB, or this will be the name of your project, whatever. There's a lot of nuances to look at here. And our version here of Visual Studio from the left, it says, we're going to install a JavaScript mobile project. Visual Studio lets you create a ton of different types of software. But in here, we've only got installed the templates for mobile. Visual Studio can let you also create C++ apps and C Sharp apps and um, just about uh, every kind of app, uh, Visual Basic and so forth. But we have a blank Apache Cordova JavaScript project. You can call it whatever you want. You can save it wherever you want. Notice me, I'll just leave it in my documents folder. This is just a test project. But when this is real, we're going to save this. You're going to save this somewhere to take it with you. Or else, of course, you're going to lose it because uh, Deep Freeze will erase everything when you leave. Uh, nothing nothing else you need to change here, just click OK. Eventually, you will get this sort of overview screen, learn about how to preview the app, read the documentation, build a design, a user interface with Ionic, 
learn how to connect with you know, uh, servers online and authentication and get push notifications, have your app send messages when something happens. What do you need to do to deploy, how to publish it, how to package it so that it can go to the iPhone store, the Android store, etc., the iOS store. All of this um, you can refer back to So there's going to be different tabs. Don't do this, but let's say you closed this tab and you wanted to get back to it. If you wanted to get back to it, that's under Project Overview. So this documentation is going to be very valuable for us later. We have a Solution Explorer, a folder tree that we'll go into detail later. And then um, we've got this project that could be um, that could be deployed to a real device. Now, if you have a real device, don't plug it in yet because we need to do some setup. But I've got a device that I plugged in and we, we will need a cable, so you don't have to do this just yet. But this project that I just created, I'm deploying it to run on my Android device that's been set up and my software and all of that. You don't have, at the moment, a, a device. But at the top here, I had selected Android device and then I clicked that little play button. You don't have that. Don't change it, but just click just click that green play button for a moment. When we learn how to set up a device, that run button will compile your, your project and run it on the device attached. Uh, yours probably said something about LG simulation, LG, something like that. So just go ahead and click that and let it activate the simulator so it can act like a device. It'll take a moment, you'll see a bunch of output at the bottom as it compiles it. And unfortunately, the very first time we do this, every time we come into this lab, it'll be the slowest. Because it has to check the latest version on the servers, various online pieces. And the first time you do a compile or a run, it will take a moment to get it ready. So in one of the handouts that I'll give you, I'll give you your, like, your to-do list of what you should do first every time you come in to the lab. We'll do it together a few times, and then you'll need to do it. Because right now I'm trying to kill time, 1 minute 26 seconds, I'm trying to kill time for it to eventually deploy. Subsequent deployments will be a lot faster. Maybe yours is already finished. But eventually you'll get a you'll actually eventually get a web browser which will simulate a device. It'll look like Google Chrome and it'll behave a lot like Google Chrome, but it'll actually be running in a mode that it's like an Android device. Oh here's mine that's coming up here. It's deploying. Stuff's happening there. And then eventually I get the sort of like welcome Cordova screen and it says device is ready. Did any of you get that yet on your screens? A few of you? Okay, good. So eventually, on your own screen, you're going to get something that says Cordova is ready. It looks like a web browser, but we will see the nuances of what, what's different about it. And here, then, this has been deployed to a real device, and you know I can rotate my device, and it rotates here too. This doesn't do anything really yet, but this is like a shell for us to then start to write our HTML, CSS, and JavaScript code go on a real device. And what I can do, you know, I can unplug it, it disconnects it there, and then I can go directly to my to my app drawer and uh, maybe confirm here, do you see an app called Test One in all my apps? Yep. So the app is installed as a real app right next to Instagram and all of that. It's not a website, it's not a web project, it's a real app installed. It doesn't do anything but it is a real app based on our HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You can't test or you can't kind of you can't really see that in your simulator. Let me load the simulator like you. But from up here I can switch between different simulators and profiles and such. And eventually when we talk about how to uh, set up a real device, because it needs a little setup, um, eventually that will deploy 
to a real device where you can test it for real and the sound and vibration and all of that that you can't quite test on a web browser. Notice the address up here doesn't look perhaps like the address you've seen before when you were testing via Notepad. And here it looks like Chrome, but it's actually attached to Visual Studio. It's up here. It's it's running in the it's running in a virtual device. I can click stop. And here I get a JavaScript console. So the usual console that I would see in Chrome now I see it in Visual Studio where I can see other things. If I try to open the console in the browser, F12 here, it will actually uh, disconnect it from Visual Studio. So we're, we're not going to use the built-in F12 debugger, the built-in F12 development tool of the browser. We're going to use the one that's in Visual Studio. Because also, I didn't show it yet, but also there's going to be a way for us to sort of simulate some of this stuff about location and rotation and such. Once we break that connection in the browser with F12, we lose that ability. Now it's a plain old website. So let me simulate that one more time. I'm going to see a lot of panels, and bigger monitors are better because you can work with all of these panels. But you see Visual Studio changes to a different mode. Here's our project code. There's the JavaScript console down here. My screen's smaller than yours, so it's a little tight over here. But then I see over here, Cordova Plugin Simulation. Do you see a tab at the top here? Plugin Simulation. So I can feed a location to the project. Right now, where in the world is this? Waterloo? Is this France or New York? Or where are we? Kitchener, that's Canada, isn't it? New Hamburg, Cambridge. Where would this take us to? Oh yeah, that's near Toronto, and yeah, that's Canada. So anyway, there's uh, there's GPS coordinates that we can send to Chrome uh, so that we can access it in our app. We can do other things here. Uh, events, fire an event. Well, an Android device has different events, different from a web browser. An Android device has a back button, for example. I can send the back button event to my simulator to simulate. What if a person pressed the back button? What do we do about it? There's pause, resume, and all of that. I'm in the app right now. I exit the app to do something else that sent a pause event to the phone. Well, I can simulate that pause event, fire that event. The app won't do anything because it hasn't been programmed to wait for that event. But we have some ability to test as a simulator here, different devices. I want to test this. What if we're acting like it's a Galaxy Note tablet? And screen sizes and all of that stuff. So testing on a real device is always going to be better. So that's why we have the class set, or you can use your own device. But it's going to be close enough-ish with a simulator. We have different versions. And one good thing about the simulator is I may have a real device to test with, but this is like a four and a half inch device. And what does my app look like on a tablet? I'm not going to go off and buy a $400 tablet just to test this. I could use the tablet profile to simulate on a tablet. It won't be perfect. It might be close enough. You can, of course, look at Craigslist and eBay to find second-hand tablets, real hardware to test on, for the full experience. I'll click Stop on that. There's a lot that has happened here simply from loading up the software and running it, which we'll look at, of course. We'll answer all of those questions, but any general questions at the moment? Yeah? So you mentioned that you could get the emulator download it, request that. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are you getting over and above what we just saw? 
Part of it is like the, the skin of it. Right now it looks like a plain old web browser, but it also feels more like the original device, and honestly, I don't think it's that much worth it to get that extra two more gigabytes. The simulator, will. this is what we'll usually use in the class if we don't have a device, and I think it works enough for us to avoid downloading much more stuff. So, let's take a break, and when we come back, I'll give you a couple of handouts. We'll further look at what we have here. This is a big can of worms. We're going to spend a couple of class meetings just to get acclimated with this, enough to then get back to our app. So I will take a break until 7.20, and then we'll go on. Be with you one moment. If you came in a little late, make sure to sign in. The sign-in sheets are here. And also make sure to use the new registration code.